Peter and Ash, um, thank you for uh, the introductions. Um, I'm Rahul Sate, Vice President of Surgical Innovation at Cambridge Consultants. Um, before I get into anything, I wanted to share a brief animation of a vision for the future of patient care. Um, and I'll play that and then I'll, I'll uh, follow up with my, my talk. This morning, Judy is reflecting on the past 12 months, how her love for painting began to fade. It's a year to the day since she was diagnosed with stage two Parkinson's disease. Six months since her pre-op neural mapping began, adding her data to thousands of other patients to optimize her therapy. 12 weeks have passed since a small robot precisely implanted a micro implant which delivers stimulation and drugs. Judy still finds it hard to believe the procedure took only two hours and that she was back home that same night. Today is her three month checkup. Judy runs a weekly scan using her neurosensing device then checks her neurological activity ahead of the telehealth console. Dr. Green reviews her cloud-based patient diary via a connected dashboard using the Neural Insight Engine to compare her results with over 10,000 Parkinson's patients' neurological mapping. He introduces Judy to her virtual recovery coach, which uses Brain Machine Interface to provide feedback on activity and cognition. Later, Judy reflects on the console. She is feeling positive about the months and years ahead and for the first time in a long time, she starts thinking about booking a vacation. Um, I hope everyone heard that okay. Uh, I'm really pleased to help contribute kicking off the innovation track for NANS this year. What we just saw was a really compelling vision for what the future of patient care and experience can be. And what I'd like to do in my talk today is share and imagine with you what the ecosystem of the future could be to actually deliver that experience. So let's take some time to think through a few things. Firstly, what does the future ecosystem look like? What are the technology building blocks to deliver that ecosystem? Who are the stakeholders to build it? How will we even build it? And ultimately, what does such an ecosystem actually enable? Now, before I dive into the details, please allow me to share the lens in which I am providing this talk. I'm very fortunate to work with over 900 engineers, designers, and scientists at Cambridge Consultants whose day job is to develop breakthrough products and systems across multiple markets. And what is exciting is the ability to take technology innovation and insights and cross-pollinate from industry to industry. And in particular, we're able to do that to bring those insights from other industries into medical devices, helping clients develop next generation smart implants, robotics platforms, critical care equipment, and digital surgery ecosystems. So what I'd like to do today is share some of our learnings and our journey into imagining what a future implant ecosystem can look like. Let's dive in. So we're all familiar with the state of the art in terms of neurostimulation today. Our industry has come a long way. And we've started to see a glimpse of the future. We already have micro implants that are able to deliver therapy, for example, in cardiac rhythm management. And it's only a matter of time before some of these innovations flow through into neurostimulation. But let's extend that concept further. We think the future of smart implants will be batteryless, it contain actuation, sensing, will be wireless, even shapeless, and have the ability to not just deliver stimulation, but potentially drugs, even gene therapy in the future. So let's consider such a micro implant in an ecosystem and think about it from the care stream from diagnostics and planning to the implant procedure to patient recovery. And what does that ecosystem look like? 
So we can imagine that microimplant providing stimulation and some sort of drug therapy, and it will be precisely implanted to a specific target location by a surgical robot, which is augmented by sensor-based tools to guide that procedure, which is also receiving real-time guidance to ensure avoidance of critical structures and having uh, high confidence in the outcomes, which is being backed by um, artificial intelligence and analytics. And of course, Dr. Green and the clinical team are always in the loop to guide the procedure. So this allows us to have a high precision, high confidence procedure, but that needs to be informed by a lot of insights much earlier in, in the disease progression. So if we're able to take neural mapping multimodal sensing of a patient's um, physiologic, kinematic, even emotional and mental well-being, and feed that into some form of planning engine that can take a large set of data and turn that into insights. Those insights can share that information with not only Judy herself, but also her clinicians, and ultimately inform a cohesive therapy strategy that will really guide the procedure, even the titration of drugs, the selection of the micro implant functionality, and allow Dr. Green to um, refine the therapy strategy as we lead up to the procedure. Now let's extend that further, post-op. Judy obviously has a micro implant or potentially several. And now, we're able to not only monitor implant performance, but also extract data, potentially control it, potentially power it. And in extracting all that data, we're able to track her recovery and feed into a virtual recovery coach that ultimately really Dr. Green and the insights from diagnostics and the procedure are informing as an initial um, regiment for recovery. Again, as Judy recovers, the data and insights um, continue to get captured in a recovery engine. And of course, Judy is now able to have a network effect and work with her support group. So she has the emotional um, support that she needs to foster her recovery. So now we start thinking about a, a really interesting ecosystem that starts to bring data and insights across the care stream. But currently, we're still thinking about it at an episode of care, and we need to stitch that all together. And this is where something like a global neurocyte engine can come into play, where it is actively gathering information of Judy's care across a, a year-long spectrum and providing those insights to a global consult team who are able to channel other patients' data and experience in to ultimately support Dr. Green in this ecosystem of care. Now, this obviously creates a complex ecosystem with lots of data and insights flowing with lots of technologies that are required to work together well. So let's think about this fundamental technology building blocks. What is actually needed? How do we even do this? So let's start preoperatively. So we talked a little bit about multimodal sensing for Judy. And many of us are familiar with various headsets that can monitor EEG signals. And these are commercialized and, and provide interesting platforms for not just EEG, but other sensing modalities. But what if we were to pair this sensing capability with other sensing? Should our industry be considering acoustic sensing or consumerized platforms to embed other sensing methodologies to augment EEG. Can we extend that further? Can we think about smart textiles? So Myant is a Canadian company that has developed smart textiles that have multiple sensors built in and connectivity. They can sense um, pressure, temperature, chemicals, movement, um, acceleration, angle. Can we pair those kinematics and those physiologic parameters with 
other sensing modalities to have a holistic picture of Judy's disease progression in addition to the, um, the clinical modes of, of scans that we're all familiar with already. So moving on to the procedure, um, surgical robotics are currently undergoing their third wave of innovation. The first wave being the da Vinci's of the world, the second generation being the much more portable, modular bedside um, systems that are um, uh, we're, we're on the end of that wave. But really the third wave is about robotics almost becoming commoditized and really being a platform for capturing data and insights. The ability to monitor, measure, precision, orientation, angulation in real time and inform a procedure is where robotics is headed. And so can we be thinking about this when we think about implants? And in order to enable that third wave of robotics, um, there's a wave of new sensing capabilities with surgical tools. For example, um, uh, there's significant literature now in using ICG fluorescence to help uh, discriminate the uh, physiologic boundaries of, of structures, whether it's nerves, vessels, ureters, um, or understand perfusion. Um, and that's just one sensing modality. There are other novel techniques like Raman spectroscopy, multispectral imaging, using structured light, um, thinking about Cherenkov luminescence. And these various imaging modalities are able to be delivered um, at a laparoscopic, uh, even a submillimeter scale, and may offer opportunities to help surgeons be much more precise in implant location. Now, if we pair robotics and advanced sensing with the intelligence of real-time guidance, we have something really powerful when it comes to uh, implants. Metapixel is a startup in South Korea, and they've developed an AI-based segmentation methodology to help cardiologists understand and, and even predict the ideal stent placement. Um, this is really exciting. Um, because they've been working very hard to link it to clinical data. And um, this is an, an emerging trend we're seeing, not just in, in cardiovascular, but orthopedics and many other applications. So let's move on to the post-op care. So we talk about a recovery coach, and that sounds fine and interesting, but what does that really mean? Well, companies like Neuro Rehab have, are using virtual reality to tailor patient-specific therapies to their own kinematics. It also allows an interesting feedback loop for the patient to feel like they are progressing and see their wins. And that's incredibly powerful, as we know, for any patient from an emotional standpoint, which naturally can help also um, their physical therapist also ensure uh, better um, downstream care. And of course, we're all familiar with Peloton and what they do with spin cycling. But they're about to release a virtual coach that uses um, an in-home camera tracking system that can give real-time feedback for, for posture adjustments. So imagine using something like that for a patient who suffers from ba ba balance or gait disorders. But let's extend that further. So some of the world's best football clubs, uh, that's soccer for us Americans, um, are using technology like PlayerMaker. It's an Israeli company that has developed a boot-worn sensing device that can measure acceleration, ball touches, um, uh, maximum velocity, impact, uh, technical balance. And they can do that for one player, but they can also do that for an entire team and allow coaching staff to see a cohort of players and their performance. What can we be doing in our industry to take such interesting technologies that are already commercially available and bring them into an ecosystem of recovery? And then finally, when we think across the care stream, um, a global neuroinsight engine, maybe that's a pipe dream. 
but there are companies and institutions already working on such areas. So Active Surgical is a startup in Boston that's focused on hardware agnostic AI-based technology to effectively be the PA to the surgeon, provide insights in real time to help even automate procedures. And perhaps maybe in other industries more classically, this has been done at scale. So GE has probably over 40,000 digital twins of their aircraft engines that are flying in the air right now. And they've been doing this for five or six years. A single engine generates about half a terabyte of data if it were to travel across the Atlantic. That's huge amounts of data. Each engine can be monitored for over 2000 parameters and GE uses that data to help inform not only um, maintenance or prediction of performance, but actually to inform their next generation of engine development. So what becomes interesting is uh, such an engine, a NeuroInsight engine, sorry, no pun intended, um, allows our industry to not only inform that particular platform that's implanted, but also gather insights for next generation development. So there are a number of technology building blocks already in existence or early in development that can come together to build such an ecosystem. The challenge really becomes in who is going to build this and how will we work together? So if we were to take such a complex ecosystem, let's think about some of the stakeholders. So clearly um, patients are at the center um, with clinicians and their clinical teams supporting their care. And they've got to work within hospital systems, within physical therapy clinics, engage with EMR systems, and rely on the innovations from device manufacturers, pharma and biotech companies, and even imaging companies as well. And of course, we've got stakeholders such as patient advocacy groups who will be lobbying. We have regulators who are regulating. And we have the money side. So uh, payers, insurance companies thinking about the, uh, their returns um, and investors looking to drive and extract value from this entire ecosystem. Of course, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There are many other stakeholders. Our single biggest challenge in our industry is how do we get stakeholders working, collaborating constructively in a way that enables Judy to have such care in the year 2030. And we're already seeing signs of collaboration, which is exciting, um, but we know realistically that everyone has different missions, everyone has different motivations. What is going to be interesting, however, is thinking even further. Who are the future ecosystem partners, enablers, potentially disruptors that can add value to an ecosystem like this? Will it be companies like Oracle, who I believe are pending an acquisition with Cerner? Will it be um, Microsoft's Azure platforms for um, cloud analytics? Should our industry be thinking about patient care in the way that Salesforce thinks about customer relationship management? Salesforce is able to track and provide insights to thousands of businesses in a very easy to digest analytical manner. Are there some synergies there? Or can we look to large hospital groups, whether it's in the US or even in Asia? For example, Apollo Hospitals in India um, at scale has been investing in looking at cardiovascular outcomes for the past 10 years within their systems and have commissioned Microsoft and their analytics and AI platforms to help them think about the ecosystem of care. Should we be engaging with large hospital systems in that way? So if we have the right technologies and we're able to overcome some of the partnership hurdles, what is the process we can think about to build such an ecosystem? So I want to share the ways that we often think about complex system development. So first and foremost, when we're thinking 10 years out, 
what first comes to mind is scenario planning. Any complex system needs to be resilient to the uncertainty of potential different future states. So how do we do that? Well, it starts by looking inward, taking leaders from our industry in workshops where we imagine future states of scenarios, and then breaking that down specifically into um, patient trends, market trends, procedure trends, business and service models, and being able to tangibly map out what we think a probable scenario might be and what might disruptive scenarios be. And it's an interesting thought experiment to then inform how we think about a system architecture. Before we get into systems architecture, however, we've got to really be thinking about unmet needs. And there are a variety of ways to do this. Um, human factors engineers are specifically trained in eliciting unmet needs, specifically not just explicit needs where a patient says, I want this, but latent needs where through observation, we can understand um, what a user truly needs. We can go through user journey mapping exercises, stakeholder interviews, and we want to pull all that insight along with scenarios to inform what a system architecture could be. Now, for, for those of you who aren't familiar, systems engineering is a discipline of engineering that thinks about complexity of systems and ecosystems. So what I'm showing on the right is just one example of, of the functional ecosystem for an implant. And it's really important that we think about functions. Um, as product developers, our minds often go immediately to the physical. What will a product look like? How big will it be? What will, it, what will its performance be? But it's really important to abstract it to the functional because it allows us to do system modeling. It allows us to think about trade-off analysis. So for example, do we really need a planning engine, an intraoperative engine, and a recovery engine? Or are we able to stitch it all together into a global engine? Do we need to think about edge computing to take the load off of some of the analytics? Can we push some of the intelligence of the implant to a wearable? So those are all interesting trade-offs that we can think through from a function standpoint. When we've got a sense of different ecosystems and architectures, it's then important to think about technology road mapping, and this is critical. We want to map the functions over the short, mid, and long term. So we want to ask ourselves questions. What technologies exist and can be developed, but what must be invented? What are the white spaces? And when and where do we partner? And this becomes important for industry players to think about their investments, their bets, their prioritizations. What needs to be started now? What needs to be hedged? And what can be started later? But this also begs an interesting question. How do we rethink R&D? Most companies in our industry have R&D teams set up to deliver products. We are not set up to design ecosystems. It's a different mode of thinking. It requires different talent, different skill sets to augment what we have today. And so it's important to be thinking that from an organizational standpoint. So I just wanna then reflect on if we can build such an ecosystem, what does it enable? So we have such an ecosystem. Well, um, it can certainly empower clinical teams with insights. It effectively, um, surgeons and clinical teams will continue to be at the center of patient care. But an ecosystem empowers that team with actionable insights, with a platform to engage with other clinicians. It empowers clinicians to deliver closed loop therapy. And you'll hear more about that topic from my colleague Ram in a little bit. It can also enable new partnerships, new business and service models that are built on the insights. Five years ago, many of us in our industry were saying, um, it's all about the data. I'm gonna say something really controversial. It's no longer about the data. Data is commoditized. It is about the insights that we can extract from data and those insights to help us understand and potentially even redefine what healthcare value means for implants and patients. 
But at the end of the day, probably the biggest single driver for doing for for exploring such an ecosystem is to help think about a new wave of clinical practice. Help inform the next generation of patient care. And so if we're able to do all of this, perhaps we can really deliver the patient care for people like Judy in the year 2030. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it.